My name is Eric Werland, and I represent the organizers of this uh, very special event. I'm very pleased to see you all, and it's a great privilege that Noam Chomsky has agreed to come to Utrecht and deliver a lecture to our students on responsibility and integrity, the dilemmas we face. The primary goal of our humanities lecture series is to motivate our students to look beyond their disciplines, become aware of broader connections, and to enable them to play the role in society that our society needs. To be able to distinguish what's going on under, behind the surface. This crucial awareness is what we as organizers are convinced Noam Chomsky's lecture will help you develop an awareness of what is hidden beyond the facades of institutional newspeak. And that's why we're here together. What does a brain of a dean of humanities look like when it's asked to introduce Noam Chomsky? When Erik Reuland asked me, I thought, this is a chance of a lifetime and immediately called my colleague at the medical center. <laughs> With an ambulance, they took me to the seven Tesla and started the MRI procedure. Clearly, we could see that there were several functions in the brain activated at different stages. First of all, the large area of proudness in the left part lightened up. Years later, this dean would be able to say to everyone in the nursing home, time and again, I introduce Noam Chomsky. <laughs> the only thing the dean hoped for was that by then, the nurses would be so kind to believe him. <laughs> then the brain activity moved to the right part, near the area of despair. Introducing Noam Chomsky was a hopeless and even impossible enterprise. Anything that would come out of the dean's mouth would be hopelessly irrelevant for everybody in the audience, since everyone knew who he was. Proof, even before eating the pudding, was that it took only two seconds before all seats for this event were sold. Close to this area, the small spot of hope flared up. Yes, maybe there was one listener who did not know who Chomsky was. The dean would design his speech exclusively for that one lost, poor, and wandering soul. As the scan proceeded, the dean started designing his academic and therefore familiar introduction. He would give the audience the titles of the books Noam Chomsky had written. For that's what all scholars do with someone who needs to be introduced. First, they name the title. Then they give a short description of the content. And finally, they give a brief overview of the impact the books had made. Lying in the seven Tesla, the dean took his cell phone and called Eric. How much time did he have for his introduction? Five minutes, Eric replied. But I need at least five hours, the dean cried out. Noam Chomsky has published 105 books between 1957, when syntactic structure saw the light, and October last year, 2010, when Gaza in crisis appeared. So one hour for reading the titles, and the second hour for giving a description of the content not only linguistics, but also philosophy, like power and ideology from 1987, or the Chomsky-Foucault debate from 2006. But not only philosophy, but also political theory, like American power and the new mandarins from 1969, to failed states, the abuse of power, and the assault on democracy from 2006 and the other three hours the dean needed for discussing the impact. He would have to limit himself to only a tiny part of this world, the Netherlands, Europe, the United States, 
and the Middle East. When the scan was finished, the dean walked out of the hospital like a new man. His brains felt clear and totally blank, like fresh fallen snow. He knew the opening line of his introductory speech. He would say, Dear Professor Chomsky, that was the idea. And then he would read a poem by one of his most beloved poets, Mark Strand. It was called The Idea. For us, too, there was a wish to possess something beyond the world we knew, beyond ourselves, beyond our power to imagine, something nevertheless in which we might see ourselves. And this desire came always in passing, in waning light, and in such cold that ice on the valley's lakes cracked and rolled, and blowing snow covered what earth we saw. And scenes from the past, when they surfaced again, looked not as they had, but ghostly and white among false curves and hidden erasures. And never once did we feel we were close until the night wind said, why do this? Especially now, go back to the place you belong. And there appeared, with its windows glowing, small in the distance, in the frozen reaches, a cabin. And we stood before it, amazed at its being there, and would have gone forward and opened the door and stepped into the glow and warmed ourselves there, but that it was ours by not being ours and should remain empty. That was the idea. Professor Chomsky, welcome. not used to such eloquent introductions. That makes it a hard act to follow. But, uh, uh, the term uh, intellectuals in the modern sense, in the sense in which we now use it, uh, pretty much came into uh, a conventional usage with the uh, uh, Dreyfusards in the late 19th century. And they're now very much uh, honored for their courage and standing up for uh, justice and, uh, uh, and uh, human rights. Uh, however, it's worth remembering that the Dreyfusards were a small minority. The great mass of uh, intellectuals in France and elsewhere uh, supported the state. And that's pretty typical. In fact, that helps us distinguish two interpretations of the common phrase, responsibility of intellectuals. Uh, one interpretation has to do with the uh, functions, the tasks, the role uh, that they actually fulfill, question of fact. Uh, another is a uh, question of value, uh, what role should they fulfill? Uh, it would be nice to say that the answer to these two questions is the same, but uh, in fact what the rather, rather typical situation is what in fact was uh, illustrated by the uh, by the Dreyfus art example. Uh, if you go f a few years beyond, into the early years of the last century, uh, World War I, uh, the intellectual classes on all sides uh, passionately supported their own states uh, in, in the First World War. Uh, there were a few exceptions, as there always are. Uh, in England, uh, Bertrand Russell, and Germany, uh, Rosa Luxemburg and uh, Karl Liebknecht uh, in uh, the United States, uh, Eugene Debs, uh, they all ended up in jail, uh, which reflects another aspect of uh, uh, intellectual life. Uh, those who depart from the assigned task, uh, support for power, framing of issues to uh, provide justifications for power, they usually uh, suffer in one way or another. Uh, how, how they suffer depends on the character of the state, but it's, uh, it's pretty common. So, for example, uh, uh, 
in the Soviet Union, in the old Soviet Union, in the post-Stalin era, uh, uh, intellectuals we call dissidents uh, were treated pretty badly. Uh, for example, uh, in Czechoslovakia, uh, Václav Havel was jailed, uh, house arrest, uh, uh, insulted, condemned. Uh, similarly, in, in the other countries of Eastern Europe, sometimes worse, but that was the typical uh, uh, situation. Well, that was bad, but it could have been worse. Uh, so, for example, Havel uh, and his associates uh, could have had their uh, brains blown out by elite Czech forces uh, uh, fresh from training in the Soviet Union uh, who already had uh, tens of thousands of uh, uh, bloodied victims to their credit. But that's not invented. That's what happened in exactly the same time in uh, U.S. domains. That happened to be in El Salvador. Uh, one week after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the, an elite unit of the uh, Salvadoran army, uh, fresh from training at the uh, John F. Kennedy Special Warfare School in uh, uh, North Carolina, uh, on the explicit orders of the government and the high command, which have since surfaced, uh, broke into the university, uh, Jesuit University, killed the rector, six leading Jesuit intellectuals, uh, major figures in Latin American intellectual life, uh, blew their brains out, killed their uh, housekeeper and daughter because the orders were not to leave any victims, uh, and uh, then uh, escaped. The, this battalion had already killed, uh, had a bloody roll of victims in the preceding 10 years. Uh, there were 10 years of major atrocities, beginning with the assassination of an archbishop reading mass, uh, called the Voice for the Voiceless, Archbishop Romero, and plenty of religious martyrs in between, plenty of uh, intellectuals attacked and killed in between. Many escaped, uh, many escaped to uh, Nicaragua, which in the 1980s was kind of like Paris in the 1930s, uh, the place where people escaped from the uh, terror states surrounding them. Then it was Stalinist Russia, Nazi Germany in uh, the 1980s. It was the various uh, terror states that the U.S. was uh, funding, supporting, uh, uh, and uh, participating in their crimes. Uh, the uh, 